Okay, so uh, right now I'm with uh, Pete Smith, who is um, an expert conservationist and uh, advocate for uh, biodiversity. Hi, Peter. Uh, thank you for taking the time to meet with me today. Could you please tell me a little bit about yourself? Okay, it's good to meet you, Littick. And um, I suppose I'm just a normal guy like everybody else, but I, I had a bit of a, a different path in life. So as a young man, I, come fr I came from the Northumberland, um, a mining town. All of my ancestors and my father were mining engineers of one sort or the other. But um, I learned to love wildlife. My grandfather, every Sunday, would take me on walks and tell me about nature. And from that, I just became totally involved with biology and nature. I then That's what my favorite subjects were school. I went on to study that. Um, and I got involved with nature conservation, both voluntarily. But, and then because of that love of nature, I actually, um, after my first degree, which was medical biochemistry, I went and did the first ever MSc course in conservation biology with the Durrell Institute. Um, and I, I set my path on being a professional conservationist. And I didn't keep on with science. I, I went into the practical world. I joined uh, wildlife charities, first Scottish Wildlife Trust, where I was a campaigner and learned all about uh, the media. I became good at fundraising. I became very good at fundraising. That's really the secret of my success early in my career. I earned a lot of money um, for the charities I was involved with. And I did all kinds of things with that, um, campaigning, marketing, and I learned all those dark arts. But I kind of knew from my expertise in biodiversity um, that we needed to have a bit of a different way of saving nature. So classically, conservation charities would buy nature reserves or they would try to give advice to landowners and they would use people to try and create habitats, which was very inefficient. And of course, rewilding was a very early rewilder. Um, I got into the concepts of rewilding and that started getting more supporters in tiny, you know, only a few little areas um, in, in Holland and Germany, in the States. Advocates saw how keystone species worked they saw, you know, all the different models, because when I went to do my uh, conservation biology, I uh, specialized in population modeling, genetic modeling systems, ecosystem modeling. So I started looking at how can we save more nature for less money? Why is nature costing so much money to protect? That is the central question. I've right. always tried to think about, and that's been my my career for the last 26 years, has been trying to answer those problems and promote the policies that would allow us both to have a thriving economy and to have lots of nature that doesn't cost the taxpayer a fortune or donors a fortune. Thank you very much, um, Peter. Um, so, uh, without uh, further ado, um, let's begin our um, foray into land value taxes and their applicability to biodiversity and ecosystem services. Beyond um, its text, beyond a land values, land value taxes textbook definition um, of tax uh, of the land value tax being unearned economic rent. Could you provide uh, uh, more insight on what a land value tax is? On the most simple explanation, um, you know, they, they, they call it an ad valorem tax on the unimproved value, rental value of land, right? And what that mm -hmm. means is you pay every year the, the cost it would cost to rent that land without any improvements any buildings, any works to improve the soil, anything, any activity that man has put in to make that land better, put a building on it or anything like that, that's not counted. It's only its location value 
or the value that nature gives it through its natural fertility or whatever okay. like that. But it's much more than that. Land value tax really, we're talking economic rent. You've mentioned the word, what is economic rent? It is monopoly. It is where you are forcing somebody else to pay money because you've created some form of monopoly, a natural monopoly, a monopoly because of government legislation or whatever. So there's a there's a there's a third tranche. We've got the first the first tranche of the textbook definition. The reality that we're talking about all forms of monopoly, intellectual property rights. There's a whole vast range of monopolies, and then we've got our third tranche to think of land value tax, which is externality, things we do that hurts other people or the planet. And we shouldn't just tax pure monopoly. We should tax externality, which is where we're robbing something from other people. We're mm. robbing from the planet. We're robbing from our future generations. We're robbing from our children. So that externality, when we pollute, when we um, take natural resources out of the ground, they're not going to be available to other people. So we are performing something that is bad, the externality, as economists call it. So you've got, you know, the basic core land value tax, which you can levy. There's the uh, levies. I mean, they're not really taxes. They're levies because it's not your money to begin with. You didn't work for it. Mm -hmm. So then you're you're taxing all forms of monopoly and then you're taxing externalities where we're doing harm. Okay. okay. I would like to ask you, how does land value tax affect commercial property developers and speculators? Okie doke. Well, land value tax, especially with regards to house building, which is the it's it's the biggest part of the economy, far bigger than farming, far bigger than commercial um, property. And how, what's going on with the property department? Well, we know if I get the chance to build a house on land, it increases that land value by whatever, a thousand percent. It's it's amazing. So the, the incentives to build housing is ginormous. The land value tax just takes all that incentive away because you can only make money by building a really nice house that people want to afford. The speculation in what's known as the uplift in the land value disappears to the property developer, okay? Because the minute you start using a bit of land, or say a house, it becomes an expensive place to own. At the moment, the minute you get the right to build a house, you become an instant multimillionaire, okay? So it is the perverse incentive is ginormous. Land value tax, takes away that perverse incentives. So people will now concentrate on building houses that people want. But think of it in other ways as well. Now with the land value tax, you won't want to have more and more land given over to property development. You'll actually concentrate land. It means that you're now going to invest more money into the land that's already built. You're gonna build better houses. You're gonna improve the houses you've got. You're gonna build denser cities, but that have much better standards of living. You know, you're gonna create really good high density areas for people to live. You're gonna create cities that flourish, but are happy places to live because you have to keep paying the land value tax, but you have to attract people to pay that land value tax. So it means you're gonna build better, not build more. That's essentially what land value tax is doing. At the moment, it is an utterly perverse market because the, the economics means not only are we trying to build houses, but a lot of the property developers aren't even building houses. They're buying up land and then sitting on it. And then they're waiting for that land to increase in value without actually doing any work. So mm -hmm. you've got this perverse system whereby people are earning money for literally doing nothing. There are houses, there are office blocks sitting empty, but the land speculator is earning money from them. In London, you know, you've got vast housing estates, 
oh, um, you know, apartment blocks which are virtually empty. You've got offices that are standing empty. Everything's inefficiently used. So a land value tax will force people to use what we've got to make what we've got better. And it will not push out development into areas that will damage nature. And that's the perfect thing about land value tax. It creates efficiency. And then if we get back to the externality idea, taxes on bad things means we use them more efficiently. So land value tax, Externality tax means efficient use of land and natural resources, which means the perfect green economy. Great. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, so next question is uh, uh, sort of complicated. Uh, so uh, who are the stakeholders of unimproved land? And let me preface this, this question by saying, you know, of course, the because of the uh, evolving uh, uh, geopolitical landscape, there are uh, various actors, uh, more actors uh, than there were uh, before, uh, 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 namely multinational corporate interests, and then uh, which are uh, stakeholders beyond um, beyond um, a country's border, and then there are more uh, local stakeholders. Could you uh, could you uh, elaborate on that further? Of course. So when we think about the stakeholders in marginal or sub-marginal land, right? Um, marginal being land which is is not really worth much to use, right? And where that margin is is super important to this discussion. Um, but the, the, the land, unimproved land, well, I wish we had unimproved land in the UK. Most of it's been affected by man. But there's a range of stakeholders, shall we say. There's the individual landowners, they're the first one, who actually owns the land. And that's where we're getting into the problem now, because land all over the world, not just the UK, is all being bought up, especially forestry land, by people who are speculating on the profits of the future of that land. They are speculating on government grants, government policy, biomass use as an energy source, and they're extrapolating future trends, they're attracting mm -hmm. investment, and then they're purchasing, and the price of land is shot up through the roof. It's now more expensive to buy forestry land in Scotland and Wales than it is to buy farmland. That's because mm -hmm. they're pricing in all that government policy income and all the subsidies to buy biofuels which is terrible and forestry is terrible for for wildlife but let's get back to this who are the landowners so we've got people who work on the land people who live in the local area the landowners themselves the financial institutions that serve them the banks then we can think of the groups you know cultural groups of people who've worked and owned and and managed the land for many years um, the people who then get employment from them, all the people in the local area, um, and then stakeholders such as representative bodies of the different bodies that represent those groups, uh, local politicians, local councillors, national politicians. So there's a whole raft of people. But the, the frightening thing for me is just how few people that is. Rural land virtually employs no one. It is a tiny fraction. Um, marginal land produces a tiny fraction of the food we eat. I mean, it, it, we're talking sub 1% of the food produced in the country, never mind the stuff we import. So what we're really talking about is a tiny group of people are the stakeholders of mm -hmm. essentially 50% of the UK. So, mm -hmm. you know, how many landowners are in the country? Well, most of the land probably 70% of the land of the UK is owned by 3,000 families. And you can okay. trace them back to the, the Norman conquest. <laughs> it's, it's frightening when you start looking at it, it, the history of land ownership and how few people actually own land. Depends where you are. If you go to Wales, there's a much greater history of individual land ownership. Um, and that's, that, that sh that's very subtle because efforts to rewild in Wales has had a huge backlash because those small landowning farmers who are far own the land and farm themselves very much were um, against efforts to rewild. They saw that as being imposed on them 
from up high by policymakers in London. So it's very complicated how these different groups work. If you go to Scotland, you have a tiny group of landowners, you know, 50, 50 landowners own a huge proportion of rural Scotland. And yeah. so it's, it's very different there. And it's all to do with the politics. As I believe Parnell said, the history of politics in the UK has always been and will always be about who owns the land. Hmm. Would you uh, say that there is uh, the stakeholders um, differ uh, geographically, that there's geographic variation, uh, not only in the UK, but also other other countries? Yes, there, there's a huge difference in how in the laws of the land are very much um, how land is governed, who owns it, what are the requirements of ownership, what are the duties of ownership, the economics of owning in the land. So we can certainly see across the globe where policies such as a land value tax has been implemented, or that there's great state control, even though it might be private land ownership, has affected biodiversity in a huge way. So the best examples are Botswana, Mm -hmm. which has, it never had the English system imposed on it. It's always had a sort of tribal land ownership where they lease okay. land to individuals. You've got areas with a huge, you know, very high density. Hong Kong, believe it or not, has got loads of really good biodiversity in the hills. And that's because a long time ago, they imposed the very same system where you had to lease land and you had to pay the government that that created efficiency in well, put, uh, making people live in a dense area, but it also protected. Another country, Japan, for many years, since the Menji Restoration in the 1870s, they imposed mm -hmm. a land value tax. And cultural norms meant that land was very um, efficiently used and you had huge areas of wild land. Norway went through a system where they had a large amount of land under agriculture. They changed back in the um, 50s and 60s, and a lot of land naturally rewilded. And Norway's had a fantastic ecological restoration due to the governing laws and the economic subsidies taxes based on land holdings. So they mm -hmm. didn't reward people. They didn't funnel subsidies into people who owned um marginal land, sub-marginal land, and that land naturally rewilded. And there's, there's many other um, examples. America, public lands, some American states have a form of land value tax, a few, but and uh -huh. that way right. allowed a much higher amount of bi um, biodiversity. Um, there's a few uh, countries in um, Latin America that also has very high proportion of land. So You've got that issue of public and private ownership, but you've got what I think is a much bigger issue is what are the rewards you get from using marginal land? And that is determining overall how much biodiversity is in your country. OK, um, so uh, let's uh, move on to a question uh, re uh, uh, regarding um, marginal uh, land. Uh, uh, in your um, um, expert professional opinion, can land value taxes change marginal land use choices? Okie dog. So what we're talking marginal land use choices, wonderful world, but essentially you're basically saying when you decide what you're going to do, are you going to farm sheep? Are you going to try and um, grow some arable crop? Are you going to have a hunting estate? Are you going to try and develop for housing? Whatever. These are your choices. And you're essentially saying, where can I make money? Um, mm -hmm. And at some point, you're saying, well, I can't make any money out of it. I'm going to leave it alone. So the, the margin of land use is a complex balance between economic choices how much effort do I have to put in? How much capital do I have to deploy? And what reward am I going to get out with it? 
but that's a purely economic and you know we're not all the rational economic man there's also cultural aspects to that and cultural aspects can be both what do i expect from the future do i expect that my children and their children and their children's children will gain benefit from the ownership and the use of this land does running a hunting state mean I'm going to meet other posh people and I can do little business deals to carve up the country a little more for ourselves? There's, there's huge right. complicated ways people will make that economic calculation. So you can do it on pure economics or you can do it on um, more complicated factors that all come into those decisions. What am I going to do with this land? Am I going to put effort in to using this land and how does that affect biodiversity and of course the worst thing we do of course is we give subsidies to people so even you know we've got agricultural subsidies subsidies just for owning the land and then we've got subsidies for production and then we've got subsidies where we subsidize the sale of that agricultural product so there's many subsidies very complicated You've got subsidies on tax treatment, you know, on uh, inheritance taxes, how you capital gains taxes, you know, farming attracts all kinds of um, ways you can spread out capital gains. There's so many little subtleties to the tax system that you benefit from, benefit from if you own the land and you farm the land. And that means less wildlife. Each one of those mm. subsidies means less okay. wildlife. And you often think that it's actually society is now paying people to destroy wildlife to give us food that cost us more than it's worth. That okay. is the insanity of our current mm. system. It is pure insanity. If you think of it like a rewilder, think of it as a, as a nature conservationist. There's other factors, social factors, but essentially in my view, those are the decisions we made. Now, if we got rid of subsidies, we got rid of all the tax perks of owning land, and we started charging the land value tax, that would completely flip it around. So those are the, the choices we're facing in land use. And of course, the best thing for landowners is to get the right to build a house on it, and then they're instant multimillionaires. You know, can you think what it would be like if I owned a few acres of land near London and somebody gave me the right to build 50 houses on it, which I could probably get at a million quid a pop? I would be sitting pretty for the rest of my life. I could send my children to private schools and put enough wealth in a trust fund that they and their children and their children would be without want for the rest of their lives. Okay. Um uh, for the sake of uh, my clarification, uh, did you say that um, th that subsidies um, on uh, that uh, deter biodiversity and are applied to agriculture would uh, would essentially backfire on yeah, even on even yes even when you have agri environment um, subsidies right where you're paying a farmer to farm a bit less intensively, right? That sounds good. It's policies, charities I've worked with, been advocating for years. But think about it. By paying that subsidy, you are getting the farmer to farm land he wouldn't farm normally. He has changed the margin of which he chooses to farm the land, whether that's by arable or grazing, or whether he bothers to farm in the first place. So that is a negative, that destroys wildlife. Even environmentally friendly farming has got a much smaller biodiversity, you know, soil content, the, all the microbes, the plants, the overall biodiversity is, is much smaller than if you just left the land alone. You, didn't, you don't even need to have a complex rewilding project where you get the grazing at the right system. So you get beautiful, gorgeous habitats that are full of subtlety and biodiversity. Just leave the land alone, you'll still have more wildlife. So that is the problem with all agri-environment schemes. Okay. Um, so going back 
uh, to some of um, my questions. Uh, what would you say are uh, the benefits of land value taxes on uh, ecosystem services and does that differ uh, between uh, uh, suburban areas and uh, urban areas? Okay, that's that's quite a complicated question. Loaded question. It's a, it's a complicated question, but it, it can be answered, but it takes a bit of thought. So we've got to think, what are ecosystem services? And basically, that is, is are you providing yourself with clean water, clean air? Are you providing yourself with rivers that don't flood your home? Um, and then ultimately, of course, we're talking about carbon. Are we going to absorb carbon sequestrated into the ground? Or are we going to release carbon from the ground, which is one of the major drivers of global climate change? Is the amount of carbon because soil carbon is the biggest source of um, uh, carbon for the biosphere, um, even more so than the sea. So we're talking about all those little ecosystem services, and then you could say that you know enjoyment of nature is ecosystem services. Now, when we say we tax land, what we're trying to do is turn land from uh, being bad for ecosystem services. I Raising sheep on the hills means all the floodwaters land on the hills and they just shoot straight off down the stream and flood the town. And then you have to spend tons of money putting in flood defences and stuff like that. If we had a land value tax, that would mean that you'd have less uh, upland sheep farming. It would be rewilded. So when the rains come down, giant sponge sucks all the water, slowly releases, meaning that you have no floods and the river runs and the droughts. So that's an ecosystem service. It, it mm. delivers uh, fresh water and health to people um, and to nature. But you've got land value taxes, but you've got to think land value taxes on everything. You've got to think about ecosystem services and habitat types and connectivity. So you need to think about applying a surcharge to a land value tax or a rebate to a land value tax based on ecosystem services delivered. And that can be incorporated into a land value tax system or can be administered by a government body, say Natural England or, or um, Nature Scott, who now use economics to achieve public policy instead of try what they do at the moment is they try to think about ecosystem services and they build a couple of tiny little demonstration projects but when they actually try to do anything at scale they run smack into the problem of land economics and they don't have enough money to do anything so land value tax in its wider sense gives you the perfect system to achieve all the ecosystem services that public policy wants to actually enact Thank you very much. And then, for oh, I forgot yeah. the urban thing. Urban things, exactly the same. So in an urban context, you need drainage, you need water purification. And so in a land value tax system, you'd be able to put in a urban um, waterways, green corridors, help people in many ways, deliver ecosystem services. But you're going to use the land value tax in cities is ginormous, right? That's far bigger than the rural area, you know. 99% of all values in urban areas. But now you will be able to earn enough money because when you build these green corridors, you'll actually cut the costs. And then the, the, the economic efficiency and attractiveness of living there means higher rents, which will pay for all of these benefits, these ecosystem services you deliver. If you have a nice park, the house prices go up next to the nice park. If you build a nice little drainage system, a green corridor incorporate it that, that then, you know, makes water nicer and um, purifies water that will result in an increase in land values, increase in tax take, pays for itself. So would, uh, is that an, um, is, is that a certain, certain plot of land on, on which uh, tax is levied? No, you just every every land should get taxed, regardless of, of who owns it. Every okay. institution that controls land should pay a land value tax, unless you can prove a public benefit by that ownership. 
uh, and that is legally binding in perpetuity, right? So it doesn't matter who owns the land, as long as they pay that tax or they provide a public service in perpetuity that cannot be changed um, okay. unless you pay the back tax um, if you want okay. to change it. Thank so, you for that. Yeah. Um, I'd like to wrap up, Peter, with uh, one uh, last question. How can land value taxes stimulate job creation? Okay, so that's this is a big topic, but you've got to think about it. We'll try and break it down into simple steps. And of course, the first thing we must talk about before we, we delve into it is the stakeholders. This is the amazing thing. Many of the stakeholders in rural, you know, sub-marginal land will actually benefit from there'll be far more jobs in the countryside relatively under a land value system. They'll have higher wages, there'll be more jobs. It will actually resurrect rural economies because that's because the taxes we have today disproportionately affect people in rural areas more than in urban areas due to the differences in their earning potential. OK, and that, it, it is true, super complicated, but let's have a look. At the moment, if I say I want to employ somebody, right? I pay employers national insurance, I pay their national insurance, their income tax on many of the forms of goods and services that they ultimately buy. That is complicated, they have to pay that. So trade is essentially taxed. Now, when you add all these up, you know, if I'm the point of paying a good worker, their marginal rate of tax could be over 70%, could be 80%. And that is compounded because everybody I want to sell something to or have some form of economic exchange has to do the same. So the amount of economic activity is utterly crushed. And then we've got the problem. We're already paying economic rent to all the owners of economic rent. The rent I have to pay or the mortgage I have to pay on my own home, on my business property, on the property of my workers, on the property of all the goods and services that they have to access. You have economic rent upon economic rent upon economic rent. And all of that stifles and crushes our economy. It makes the goods and services we sell abroad to each other. It crushes our economy. Now, how do we solve this conundrum? And this is where land value tax comes in. Land value tax means that you're taxing economic rent. So economic rent disappears, but you're not for having any other. So I basically am going to pay the same amount of economic rent for my mortgage, for my rent, to all the other people who have to pay it, but I don't pay any other taxes. So I'm literally halving my true tax rate, right? I am paying half of what I was before. So I get higher wages. And then think of all the jobs that creates. I get half wages. I can employ more people. The customers are richer. There's more customers who are in employment. Suddenly the economy booms. The wages skyrocket. Everybody has, and especially in rural areas. It is a fantastic system that's been well known by economists for hundreds of years. There is a problem. Landowners, people who receive economic rent, are now poor. They don't receive any economic rent. All those banks, all those, you know, banks will have to do productive work. They'll have to give services better. Landlords cannot just sit there counting their money. They'll actually have to work for their money, improving their, their lives of their tenants, making everything better. The rural landowner cannot just sit, send his kids to public school and think which is the best Range Rover to buy. He now actually has to do some work. And that actually improves the economy as well. We have a parasitic class at the moment who sit there sucking the life out of us and not actually as a productive member of society. Now they have to become productive members of society. So we've got that system. Jobs explode. Most of us will be working three days a week. You know, we'll do jobs that we want to do, not what we're forced to do. You know, getting clean will cost more than getting a, a, an engineer because it's a hard job to do and nobody wants to do it. Now, let's add externality taxes. 
see, we're going to tax carbon, we're going to tax pollution, we're going to tax those nasty pesticides, right? Now they are included in the economy. We now start choosing to use less carbon, less land, less pollution and everything because marginally things, goods and services that contain less pollution, less carbon, less things that do damage are, are much cheaper, much, much cheaper. So we all start actively making the free market, the power of the free market become the ally to combating climate change, the ally to reversing biodiversity loss, the ally to giving the revenue of the government to provide us with education, transport, houses, looking after poor and sick people. We'd have a utopia. And this is why once you learn about land value taxes, people get so excited. But it's really tough on the brain, you know. I've got an IQ that's normally measured 170 to 180, and a lot of other land value taxes are equally uh, nuts as me. So once you learn how the economy works truly, and you actually start reading the, the kind of people who've supported land value tax, the greatest geniuses in history, you know, we're talking Tolstoy, Albert Einstein, you know, there's so many people who've discovered land value tax, the greatest minds of histories. It's hard to understand, but once you understand it, it is so amazing what it could do for us. But then we see why hasn't it happened? And that's because lazy people who sit in government institutions who make policy are the ones who don't want land value tax because they're earning loads of money without doing any work and they don't want it to change. They're quite happy with the system we've got, even though it incentivizes people to destroy the world around us. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, really uh, liked having those um, insightful uh, answers um, to, uh, to, uh, the que to my questions. And um, uh, I hope you have a great time in your, uh, in your efforts and keep the efforts to uh, uh, in your conservation efforts uh, ongoing um, and um, uh, look forward to um, uh, se uh, seeing your presence more in the, um, the various uh, 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 forays into, la um, into biodiversity and conservation. Thank you very much. You are very welcome.